From Boston University and BU Alumni Relations, welcome to Proud to Be You Around the World. I'm your host, Jeff Murphy, and this season we're taking the podcast on the road to meet some of our most interesting and accomplished alumni navigating life and careers in cities across the globe. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Dan Gardner back as the guest host for this episode. Dan's my colleague here in BU Alumni Relations, and he's also a current student working towards his MBA at the Question School of Business. Dan, thanks so much for taking over. Thanks so much for having me back, Jeff. Today's guest is Takeru Nagayoshi, graduate of BU's Wheelock College of Education and Human Development and the 2020 Massachusetts Teacher of the Year. Takeru came to BU by way of Teach for America, and he earned his Master of Education while working at New Bedford High School in the English Department. He hails from Providence, Rhode Island, and is one of our nearly 6,000 alumni who call the Ocean State home. I talked to Takeru about his journey from delinquent student to teacher of the year and what it takes to bring about systemic change through education. Takeru, thank you so much for being a guest on the Proud to Be You podcast. We are thrilled to have you here. Thank you for having me. Let's rewind the tape for a minute and uh, go back and talk about kind of what you wanted to be when you grew up. Did you always know that you were going to be a teacher? No, I, I, I certainly think that teaching is would have been the last career that I would have gone into. In high school, I was interested in politics. I did a lot of debate-related stuff. And in college, I, uh, for undergrad, studied international relations. My mom worked at the United Nations. So I don't know. I, I always thought that I'd be in government or NGOs or nonprofits. I was actually also really unsuccessful in school. And so uh, especially during my middle school years and, and, and kind of internalized this idea that school in many ways is for certain kinds of kids, you know, smart kids. And, and I didn't fit that mold. And so definitely think a lot of my middle school teachers would be shocked uh, to find that I'm a teacher now. I was disruptive. I was late to class every day. It was pretty confrontational. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm surprised to find myself here, uh, let alone get recognized so publicly for it. So your mom uh, working for the United Nations, does that mean you did you move around? Were you, you know, did you spend most of your elementary school and middle school years all in one place? Yeah, no, I, I kind of hopped different school systems. And so uh, when I was young, I would go to a public school. I, I, I'm in a private school, I'm sorry, uh, in New York City, uh, the United Nations International School. And that was through the work that my mom had but around the time I was in fourth grade. And I believe up until eighth grade for about five years or so, I went to Nagoya, Japan. And uh, it was the first time that I experienced uh, a Japanese public school education there. And it was quite an experience being a Japanese language learner. You know, we spoke Japanese at home. I'm a heritage language speaker and I'm definitely conversant, but, you know, doing well academically, let alone feeling comfortable in a culture enough to be successful uh, in a school system was a, was a separate issue. And so uh, by the time I was Around in seventh grade, I started to slip behind academically. I was that kid who would skip second period math class, you know, to avoid dealing with my math algebra teacher because he was so annoying. And, and it really wasn't until uh, I moved back to the States that I feel like I had more positive educational experiences. Uh, and that's not to say that, you know, the school system in Japan does a bad thing. I think, in fact, there are a lot of incredible things that it does, like the community orientation and the value in treating the space of, of the classroom as, as something that's owned by everyone. You know, those are things that I certainly uh, respect and try to have incorporated in my classroom culture as well. But I think what the U.S. education system does better is is, is amplifying and giving voice uh, to students. And those were the experiences that I started getting once I moved back to the States uh, in the eighth grade. So when you came back to the States and started to buckle down and take your education a little bit more seriously, did you know you wanted to go to college? Was that the expectation? And how did you decide where to go for your undergrad? I wanted always uh, to go to college. I feel like that was an expectation at home. I think I was, uh, I went to Brown for undergrad and was really attracted to the liberal arts open curriculum approach that they had to what learning is. And I think as an institution, they really valued uh, this idea of being your own architect when it comes to uh, the learning experiences that you have. And so not really knowing necessarily what it was quite that I wanted to do. I, I went in and at a liberal arts school, ended up getting my degree in international relations, which is also super broad and interdisciplinary. But, you know, I, I, I always gravitated towards subjects that were sociological in nature, things that contemplated on how society functions, 
uh, how norms, ideas uh, kind of mesh together. And, and education is a really great uh, example of that. And so a lot of the work that I do in the classroom is always connected to the societal conversations that are taking place. And, and part of the work uh, that I see as important as an English teacher, as a humanities teacher, is, is connecting uh, the learning and the skills that my kids do to these broader you know, conversations that are taking place in society. And do you, do you feel like when you uh, settled on international relations, do you feel like that was really inspired by your upbringing, uh, having a mom who worked for the United Nations? I, I, I feel like that must come into play a little bit. Uh, do you think you were being nudged in that direction? Yeah, I, I definitely was looking at uh, my mom as an inspiration. She's always a really strong and, and, and fierce woman. And looking at the awesome things that she did was certainly a reason that made me go into that direction. My brother also did political science. Um, my sister also did foreign relations. And so I think there's a sense of interest in uh, how the world works, how the society works, analyzing humanities at sort of this, this, this macro level uh, unit of analysis. Uh, I think is something that I've always been intellectually, academically curious about. Certainly in college, I had thought that that would be international relations, you know, as an answer. But after joining teaching, you know, that new answer for me uh, that still flexes those same ways of thinking is is education. And so when you uh, were accepted into TFA, what district were you placed in? I was placed in the New Bedford uh, district. It is in the southern coast of Massachusetts. I've never been before prior to that experience. Uh, it's about 40 minutes or so away from Brown. And so I know that I was placed there because of the sort of communal ties, uh, this certainly demographic similarities between uh, some of the student populations in the Rhode Island Providence area. Uh, and the Massachusetts, New Bedford area are pretty similar in that we serve a lot of Portuguese, uh, Cape Verdean, uh, Dominican students, for instance. We were a school uh, that was undergoing uh, what's called a turnaround plan. And uh, because of some historic struggles around uh, graduation rates and test scores, uh, the state identified as, as a school of needing intervention. And, and part of their uh, solution was to make sure uh, that you know, we were getting uh, quality teachers. And I think Teach for America was, was, was part of that. Absolutely. It's remarkable to me that you went to Brown, you had this uh, focus on international relations, you know, your own educational experience was certainly a story unto itself. And then you dive into TFA, you know, you're welcomed into the New Bedford community. And somehow, uh, right around that time, you also made a decision to really double down on your commitment uh, to education as a career path. And so can you talk a, a little bit about what the decision making process was behind uh, coming to BU and pursuing a master's degree? Yeah, and, and so I, I actually did uh, the one-year program across two years. Uh, it was in the first two years of my teaching, and I was a teacher full-time. And, and at the time, I was uh, living in Fall River, southern Massachusetts. So I still remember having to drive up to Boston for an hour uh, right after school in rush hour traffic after teaching all day. And, and, and having to sit in another two-hour seminar afterwards was definitely not a cakewalk. It was part of the partnership that the Massachusetts uh, Teach for America had with BU in making sure that not only are our teachers prepared to become good educators through you know, Teach for America as an organization, but also we're getting uh, the, 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 the licensure, the pedagogy, the, the, the content right, um, that is relevant to the coursework that we are teaching. And, and so it was really a no-brainer to, to, to sign up uh, for that partnership and, and get my uh, degree while teaching full-time. And you know, luckily for me, everyone was doing it. So I had all of my Teach for America friends to carpool with and, and to keep me company. Our, our ritual was to get dinner at Noodle Street on Commonwealth Ave, uh, and then to head to Java Juice for a smoothie before our class. And yeah, I, I guess looking back, like a lot of the uh, rides to and fro, we would call them our, quote, forced reflection time. Um, and, and that was always a great way to debrief some of the difficult times that we had throughout the day and also talk about what we learned in class. You know, we're stuck in a car with like four or five other people for about an hour, you know. Um, and, and those are the moments that I think looking back in my BU experience that I certainly cherish. 
edge and, and, and uh, when you can connect, right, the, the coursework that you're doing uh, to the lived experiences that you have in the classroom, especially in a social way, I think that's the kind of authentic and relevant learning experiences that make for impact. Um, and, and therefore, you know, as a teacher today, I try to replicate in my classroom as well. Absolutely. And among all the, the classes that you took in earning your master's degree, what is it that you carry with you to this day from your BU experience? I feel like a lot of the classes that I remember are, are those that were related to my concentration area. And so my licensure is in English. And so uh, I took a lot of courses in, in writing and uh, reading, how to teach that uh, literacy in general. Professor Christina Dobbs, uh, she had this great methods class on, on teaching reading that was sort of foundational to my understanding of, you know, the, the practices and, and, and really the sociology behind why and, and why not kids have difficulty reading. Another class that I really liked that, that all the, the teachers who were in my program liked was by a professor called Sarah Miller. And she taught a class that I think changed my trajectory on what it means to be a part of a school community. And prior to that class, I had thought that that, you know, being a good teacher means just doing the stuff that you got to do in your classroom and getting the results that you need to do in terms of test scores. And actually, that's not important in the long term. It's, it's, it's whether or not you're able to build a community, not just within, but amongst, you know, and within a broader system that our kids are a part of. And so that's definitely a theory that I, 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 I heavily lean in on and, and try to make a core component as to what my, my teaching is like. I also want to give a shout out um, to another teacher, actually. Uh, Scott Sider was my advisor and and I did an independent study with him and I had to collate a bunch of uh, literature on, on on racial identity development for teachers and and part of that independent study I ended up writing a manifesto uh, for for how my experience as an Asian teacher especially in a place like Massachusetts where you know fewer than one percent of us exist was like and so uh, that was definitely pretty awesome I feel like the professors are super accommodating and, and, and really understanding that a lot of us were in service practitioners and so you know they made our projects and, and assignments uh, as responses to the problem problems, you know, that we were experiencing directly in the classroom. So I really appreciated how their their, their pedagogy as, as, as teacher teachers centered on uh, relevance and, and also a compassion of, you know, some of the difficult places that we're coming through. Yeah. And I want to go back to one thing that you you mentioned, and it's getting back to that sense of uh, community. I'd still love to hear a little bit more about what it's been like, what your experience has been living in Providence, working in New Bedford, and what that community has come to mean to you. You know, New Bedford uh, has an interesting history in its recent years. Uh, our, our district schools, for instance, back in the 70s, 80s, uh, used to be a blue ribbon school, prized for you know a lot of the great things that are happening. And over the years, because of the shifts in population and the the increase in English language learners whom I think our school system didn't do a good job in, in addressing when it came to their linguistic needs. We started to experience a decline. Around the time that I started teaching at New Bedford, we were in the first year of our turnaround plan. When it comes to, to school accountability, I think there are definitely good things in terms of making sure that the people who are serving our children are the best that they can be and, and making sure that our school administrators and leaders are doing the, the best that they can. But at the same time, it had a stigmatizing effect, I think, in a lot of the, the narratives that surrounded our, our students, our school community, uh, were that of destitution. And, and it, it, it's not uncommon even today, really, to get a, an eye roll or a side eye or a, oh, you are doing God's work type of uh, faux compassion uh, when I say that I work at New Bedford. And that's really the kind of narrative that I wanted to push against. Great things happen all the time. And, and there's this tendency for us to just focus on some of the difficulties and challenges that we have with without necessarily acknowledging the systemic structures that beget those challenges in the first place. And so, you know, part of my journey in, in, in becoming the teacher of the year and, and something that I want to commit to uh, for the rest of the year is, is highlighting the, the resilience and the strength uh, that, you know, our population has, that our school community has, and how uh, great things are, are, are constantly happening. And, and you don't have to look at other places that are, that are better resourced. I love that I can hear so much of your passion for and uh, the, the understanding and the sociological lens that you've 
brought to education. And I'm wondering if you would reflect on, you know, what it what it meant to receive the notification that you were named the 2020 Teacher of the Year in the state of Massachusetts. I saw it as a win for my students. And obviously, I, I wouldn't get the title had it not been for my kids. I wouldn't get the title had it not been for the leaders at our school, um, my coworkers who pushed me, the people who challenged me. Being called Teacher of the Year is 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 is, is less of the, the the flex around it, so to speak, and, and, and more of an opportunity to be an ambassador to, to issues that I think are 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 important. Um, and so, coming from a school like New Bedford, that is about supporting our students uh, with certain needs because of their socioeconomic status or their citizenship status, or uh, it's about advocating for community based you know school reform um, and, and 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 moving away from this emphasis on just data without looking at uh, the causal factors behind uh, what makes a community suffer and, and how that affects education. It's about you know, leaning in on my own experiences as a person of color, as a, as a queer person of color, um, and, and, and ensuring that the, the, the people who are teaching our kids uh, are those who, who look like them, um, who uh, have gone through experiences similar to them, uh, and, then, and then having uh, classroom, you know, cultures and spaces and curricula uh, that is culturally responsive and, and leans in on, on, on values like equity that I think are important. So in addition to all the work that you're doing in the classroom, you also somehow have found time to contribute to the broader dialogue as an author of a number of op-eds. And so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the other work that you're doing outside the classroom and uh, how you sustain that energy and continue those conversations. Yeah. Well, actually, my secret is, is that in the summer, I write all these op-eds and then I strategically think of a time to release them throughout the year. That's brilliant. <laughs> no, I, I, I have... I I feel like I have a lot of thoughts and um, a lot of those op-eds that I've written have been conversations that I've had late night with with my teacher friends and um, my coworkers. And they're about things that I care about, about diversifying the workforce, about supporting our LGBT students around what it means to, to, to hold a school accountable under a turnaround system. And so I try to lean in on the experiences that I have, you know, those that tap into my own identity, but also those that tap into the work that I've done with my kids here at New Bedford. And if I can connect that to a broader conversation that's taking place in, in debates of education in, in, in our in our state, in our country, that's definitely a, a muscle that I would like to flex. I've never seen myself necessarily as a writer, um, but you know, I feel like as an English teacher, I should practice what I preach. We've talked about some of the challenges and the systemic issues uh, that are at play within the education system, within your community, and it's certainly replicated in so many other communities across the country and around the world. But I'm wondering if you take a minute just to tell me a little bit about what makes you happy in your job? What do you love about your job? I'm an introvert by nature, but I feel like teaching is a profession that forces me to be cheery and, and, and lean in on my social skills. And I think that's a good reflection of what teaching does in general. It, it, it's a profession that I think pushes us uh, to step outside of our comfort zone and, and to really model what it means to be the best version of yourself. And I say this example a lot. I, I think about my mindset when I was first a teacher, you know, versus now. And I think the first day of teaching, if I'm being honest, I was more concerned with, uh, you know, how my outfit was going to look like the next day. Uh, and, and now I stay at school until eight o'clock because I'm so frustrated that a kid didn't get uh, this concept that I've been hammering on, or I, I worry about an interaction that I've had, or, or I, I, I wonder if I should call the student's parent. And it's one of those jobs that really consumes who you are. And as teachers, we want to be authentic and, and honest about what we are and, and how we present ourselves to our kids. But it also requires us to be selective in, in what we reveal, I think, to a large degree, because we are this, this symbolic entity as adult figures in the eyes of our children. And so it, it, it's definitely a profession that forces and certainly forced me to be the best version of myself, because I am that an actor of the values that I think are true, but might not always follow when I'm alone in my private life. Uh, and so when I'm in the classroom, I, I, I honestly think that I'm my best self, I'm a better person and more compassionate it and more attentive, goofy, vulnerable, I'm sincere, more than I am ever outside of the classroom. And that's really because my kids hold me accountable. And so if there's anyone listening, um, and if you want to be a better person, please 
enter education, uh, I promise you teaching will make you a better person. And it's also super fun. And as you think about uh, the future, you've talked about uh, some of the things that you hope to accomplish and the issues that you want to be an advocate for as you're celebrated, you know, in 2020 as the Massachusetts Teacher of the Year. But where do you go from there? What are the things you're looking forward to tackling next? I would like to see what my role in the classroom is going to look like in the next couple of months, years. I do recognize that a lot of the issues that I see amongst my students, amongst my school community are sort of beyond uh, what a teacher as a content instruction you know, person could necessarily do. And so there's a part in me, and again, going back to this, this idea of, of systemically analyzing the education system as a whole, that makes me want to, to be a person who makes those broader uh, decisions. And, and and that also comes from a place of realizing that the people who are currently making a lot of the decisions, be they on law or policy, what teachers do, what students should do, don't necessarily have the lived experience of being an educator, don't necessarily have the lived experience of working in a community that I do. And so for now, I would like to, to, to gain that experience uh, and to develop my theory as to what it means to make a good school and to uh, impact students in a substantive way. And, and when I'm ready, I move on to the next step um, to hopefully make impact at a, at a broader scale. Absolutely. Well, I know all of us at BU, we are so proud um, of what you've accomplished as an alum, as an educator, and we are really grateful that you would take, take some time with us to share a little bit of your story and share some of the things that you've learned. And we're just really grateful for your time and uh, we appreciate you being on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It was such a pleasure to speak with Takeru, and I'd like to thank him once again for making time for us here on Proud to Be You. You can find links to a few of his most recent op-eds in the show notes of this episode. And since we recorded the interview, Takeru also received the Young Alumni Award from BU's Wheelock College of Education and Human Development during Alumni Weekend 2019. So we'd like to congratulate him once again. Thanks again, Dan. I really enjoyed listening to your conversation with Takeru, and I really appreciated his thoughtfulness and candor. Great job. On behalf of everyone on the BU Alumni Relations team, thanks so much for listening to Proud to Be You. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and review our podcast wherever you find your episodes. I'm Jeff Murphy, and no matter where your path takes you, be proud to be you. The Proud to Be You podcast is produced by Boston University Alumni Relations. Our theme is from Jump and APM Music. To learn more about Proud to Be You, visit bu.edu slash alumni slash podcast.